Gentlemen, we can rebuild him. We have the technology. Better than he was before. Better. Stronger. Faster. More power, baby! What's up everybody and welcome to an extremely special episode on the Engine Gremlin channel. This episode has been a long time coming and I am so excited to finally bring it to you guys today. I am going to be showing you step by step how to build this. The ultimate Ford straight six motor build. Now everything that I'm going to be talking about today is actually largely applicable across the board for the US Ford straight six motor. So I'm talking about the 144, the 170, the 200 that you see here, the 250, and a lot of it's actually even applicable to the Ford 300, one of my favorite motor builds of all time. Uh, now this particular build is a full EFI conversion. So we're talking sequential port fuel injection, uh, coil near plug spark, Holly HP ECU. We're not actually going to be covering the EFI portion of that today. That's gonna to be coming in a couple of weeks with a follow on episode that's dedicated totally to the EFI uh, conversion of these motors. Instead, what I'm going to be talking about today is taking your rusty, crusty old straight six with no horsepower, albeit good gas mileage, and rebuilding them from the ground up so that you have a lean, mean little horsepower machine that is focused on performance, reliability, and gas mileage. So winning on all fronts. And I'm talking about more than doubling the horsepower that these motors came with from the factory. And we're going to be focusing on getting it to a point that any home builder or somebody who's maybe not EFI inclined or doesn't want to go EFI can still run a traditional distributor style system with a carburetor or maybe a throttle body fuel injection system like a Holly Sniper EFI 1100 that are built for these motors. But before we get to any of that, I actually want to give a huge shout out and thank you to our sponsors uh, to date who have helped us with this build. I'm talking about Vintage Inlines, Claysmith Cams, Yelaterra, Holly, DC Racing Engines. Thank you guys so much for all of your support up to date, culminating in this build. Your, your support has been immeasurably appreciated. You guys have been absolutely wonderful to work with. Now, we're gonna be talking about our sponsors a little later in the video, but for now, I think we're gonna go ahead and get started on how to build this. Now one of the first things that you're going to want to do is look up the bore specs for your motor. You can find these either in the maintenance manual or in a standard shop manual like we have here. Once we had that information, Rick loaded it onto the bore machine and then leveled it. Now as you can see here in the cylinder walls, we actually had some grooves that had formed from the pistons over time. And because of that, we actually had to bore a little extra out. We were originally planning to bore this out to 20 thousandths over, and it had eventually had to go to 25 in order to get those grooves out. Once Rick had centered the bore machine over the cylinder, he begins doing the boring operations. He'll do this in several steps, a little bit at a time, making sure that we don't overshoot. Once all the cylinders have been bored out to their major diameter, just a few thou shorts of final, it then goes over to the honing machine. Now the honing machine uses a set of specific stones and is calibrated to create a crosshatch pattern on the cylinder walls. This crosshatch pattern helps oil lubricate the cylinder walls. Once the cylinders have been honed, we then go over to the decking machine. The decking machine is going to take off a very thin layer off the deck of the motor block. This is going to give you a smooth surface for your gaskets and is also going to ensure that your motor is perfectly level with respect to the cylinder head and the pistons. Once we've completed the decking, Rick goes through here and adds a mild chamfer to the top of the cylinders, which also helps remove any burrs. He also does this for all of the oiling channels and for the coolant passages. 
After this, we took some time to paint the block and then to paint the cylinder head. Now we're using a Hemi Orange, which sounds like sacrilege considering it's a Ford. However, once you see the final product, I think it'll make sense. Next it's time to install the crank, but before we can do that, we need to line hone the bearings for the crank. We start by installing the studs for the main caps. Now we're going with studs because they provide significantly stronger strength, which is important in this build because we have significant power adage for this build. Once the studs were in place, we then put in the lower halves of the crank main bearings. Next we slid on the crank caps with the upper half of the crank main bearings installed. We gently tap them into place using a rubber mallet. Next we use plenty of ARP Ultra Torque Lube on the threads of the studs. Remember to use plenty of ARP Ultra Torque Lube anytime you're installing the studs or removing them. This will prevent your hardware from galling or binding and is going to give you a better result in the end. We then torque the caps down in three stages using two-thirds torque, three-quarters torque, and then finally 100% final torque. Using a set of micrometers, we measure the main journals of the crank to ensure that you get even load distribution on the main bearings. Typically on a crank, you want your journals to be within half a thousandth of each other in diameter. Next we use a bore gauge to determine the diameter of the main bearings. When we subtract the diameter of the main bearings from the diameter of the main journals, this will tell us the amount of clearance that each main bearing has between the crank. Typically you're going to want to shoot for something between a half a thousandths and two and a half thousandths. Now we're a little under, so in order to get it a little bit more clearance, closer to two and a half thousandths, we send it to the line hone machine where it uses a set of specific stones, just like the honing machine, to bring it within tolerance. Rick then uses a bore gauge again to ensure that the main bearing clearances are within spec. Next it's time to install the cam bearings. Once you've positioned the cam bearing lightly in place, Rick is using a cam bearing installer that he's pushing through the block all the way until it rests against the cam bearing. Once they're both positioned in place, you'll use the end of a rubber mallet to lightly tap it into position. Make sure that when you're installing the cam bearings that your oiling passages align with the oiling passages from the main bearings. One thing we want to mention here is that when you're installing your cam bearings, make sure that you have appropriate lubrication so they don't gall or get marred and they go in easier when you're trying to tap them into place. Use a flashlight to determine if the oiling hole in your cam bearing is aligned with the oiling passage for the main bearings. You should see plenty of light and should be able to see clear through. Now I'm going to kick it over to, we'll say past me, uh, to talk about our sponsors for the cam that we're about to install. Thanks future me. Now our first sponsor for today's video is Clay Smith Cams. Clay Smith Cams is a third generation family owned and operated business based out of California. Uh, they source all their materials and have all their operations right here in the U.S., so they're a U.S. family-owned and operated company. Now, they specialize in high-performance and custom grind camshafts, as well as a few other performance component, components 
for custom builds. Now this is probably the singularly best place here in the US that you can get a grind a camshaft for your Ford Straight 6. Now the one we have here uh, in front of us is the uh, 264-274 grind. This is a high performance custom grind camshaft by Clay Smith uh, designed for either the 144, the 200, the 170, and the 250 uh, cubic inch straight six motors. Um, this is a high performance camshaft ground by none other than Nick Woods of Clay Smith Cams. Uh, this is designed to operate in the mid to high range um, and one of the things that I want to point out about this camshaft, and they do this for every custom grind shaft that they do, is that they will stamp on there, or chemical etch I should say, the part number, who it's for, their custom logo, who made it, and whether it's custom or not. So just a terrific amount of detail that goes into these camshafts, and every single one of them is just the highest quality that you can get. So. A huge thank you to Clay Smith Cams for sponsoring us and actually being our very first sponsor and providing us with this camshaft. Now, there's a couple other things that Clay Smith Cams was very generous enough to uh, sponsor us with. First one being this double roller timing chain by JP, for, JP Performance in California. Now, some of you might be asking, why do you want to upgrade to a double roller timing chain? What's wrong with the single roller? Well, there's nothing wrong with the single roller timing chain. It's just that the double roller timing chain not only provides added strength from being a billet uh, material piece of hardware as opposed to cast, but also because it's a double roller timing chain, it's going to be less susceptible to stretch, which ultimately results in retarded timing over time, which results in decreased performance. It also gives you greater protection from a break in a timing chain, as rare as those are, because if you break a timing chain, you're going to be in trouble. Some of the other things that they were kind enough to sponsor us with were the lifters that are designed to work with our Yella Terra 1.65 ratio roller rockers. And I'm going to talk about them in just a second, but I will say that these uh, hydraulic lifters are just fantastic. They are an oiling design, which means that they are designed to push oil through the push rod and up to the valve train to keep it lubricated. And you'll notice that they even have their logo stamped, not even stamped, ECE'd on each and indiv each every individual lifter, which is a great detail. They also provided us with these ARP head stud kits and the ARP uh, rod kit. Now. What's great about these is that when you switch over from a bolt to a stud kit, it's actually a lot stronger. Now included in these kits, not only is each and every one of the studs, but it also comes with the associated nuts and the associated washers, as well as ARP's Ultra Torque Lube, which you're going to want to use on every assembly. So huge thank you to Clay Smith Cams. Like I said, please go check them out. We also have an episode out called Ask the S Experts, where I talk to Nick Woods of Clay Smith Cams, and we talk about the anatomy of a camshaft and what you're going to be looking for in a performance camshaft. And eventually we're going to be talking to him again, talking about which parameters of a camshaft, what kind of grind is going to be good for your Ford 200 straight six. So again, huge thank you to our first sponsor. Uh, I'm going to go kick it to other other me. So to talk about our next sponsor. Uh, so over to you other other me. Now it's time to install the cam. Start by greasing the individual lobes on the cam as well as the bearing surfaces. It's recommended that you use a grease that has a high amount of ZDDP or zinc for breaking in the motor. Now it's in time to install the block core plugs. We're using an aircraft grade sealant around the rim of where the plug goes and on the plug itself. This will ensure that we have an absolutely 100% leak proof block. In order to install the plug, simply place it over the hole 
Then using something that's slightly smaller in diameter than the plug itself, tap it in place using a rubber mallet. You can also use a regular hammer if you wish to do so. Now the Ford 200 also has two threaded plugs, one on each side of the block. Apply some aircraft sealant, put the plug in place, and simply screw it in using an Allen wrench. It's finally time to install the crank. We started by installing the lower halves of the main seals and lubricating them. Then it became time to install the front and rear main seals. To install the front and rear main seals, start by putting a bead of engine sealant in the groove for the seal in the block. This will ensure that you have an appropriately oriented seal and ensures that it's that much more leak proof. Now it's time to put in the lower half of the main seal. When you install the lower half of the main seal, make sure you offset the split in the seal from the split in the block. This will ensure that you don't have a leak path directly through that split. You'll want to offset it about 10 degrees. So before we show you guys how to install the rear main seals on these motors, I actually want to give you guys a little bit of a history lesson. Uh, back when they were making these motors, the rear main seals were made of a sophisticated polyurethane weave infused with graphite. In other words, this. This is literally a piece of rope. These were the rear main seals that they used in these, in these motors. It's a piece of rope. And they're terrible. They're awful. They're almost impossible to get to see right. They leak like sieves. And ironically, they still sell these today. So if you're ordering a gasket kit, uh, to replace the seals and gaskets on your motor and it comes with one of these take it and throw it away They're No good get rid of them instead get yourself one of these now. This is a modern style rubber and metal uh, Rear main seal this in particular is made by Felpro. These are awesome. They're they're much easier to install They seal really well. You're not gonna have any problems with them whatsoever the only problem that you're gonna have with these is finding them because as it is there is a national shortage of these little guys and they are almost impossible to find across the nation uh, so this actually is a plea for help to felpro please 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 start making some of these again because they are impossible to find and we hope that this motor build actually inspires some folks to do a uh, rebuild of their own motors using these uh, again please start making these and as i mentioned to you do yourself a favor, take that little piece of crap of rope, throw it away, get yourself one of these, you'll be glad you did. Now unfortunately we actually lost the footage of installing the rear main seal up close and personal before installing the crank. At this point you want to lower the crank into the block. Next place your caps on top of the main journal bearings for the crank, making sure that they're adequately lubricated and they have the seals installed. Then tap them down lightly with a hammer. When it comes time to do the front and rear main seals, simply repeat the process that you did on the block on the caps themselves. Place a bead of engine sealant in the groove and then place it back down, making sure to keep a split in the seal offset from the split in the block where the oil pan attaches. Once all the seals and caps have been properly seated as well as the bearings, 
you're going to want to torque it down to final torque, again using the method of 2 thirds torque, 3 quarters torque, and then 100% final torque. Do this in a spiral pattern in so that you ensure a good even distribution of load on the crank journals. And now it's time to gap the rings before we can install the pistons. For a Ford 200, you're going to be wanting a gap between 17 and 20 thousandths. You can determine the gap by using feeler gauges like the one shown here. For each piston, you're actually going to be gapping four different rings. You're going to be gapping two compression rings and two oil rings. To gap the rings, start by setting them in place on a ring gapper like the one shown here. Once you have the ring held in place using set screws, determine touch off points using the dial gauge. Once you've determined zero on the machine, slowly take off material on one side of the ring until you're about halfway there. Then flip the ring over and take off the material again. It's recommended that you actually do this in several stages, placing them back in the block and measuring them each time to ensure that you don't accidentally overshoot your measurement. It's important to remember to go slow and take your time, only taking a few thousands off at a time when you're gapping the rings. Remember, you can always take off more material, but you can't put it back on. If you overshoot your gap, that means you need to buy new rings. Once you've completed taking off material on the machine, Remove the ring from the machine, and then using a very fine file, take off any micro burrs that may still be on there. Now place the ring back in the block using a ring setter. Use your feeler gauges to determine the gap in the rings. We're aiming for a minimum of 17 thou. Perfect, nailed it. Now it's time to assemble the piston rings. You may notice that the rods and the pistons are already assembled, and unfortunately that happened when we weren't in the shop, so that's something we're going to be skipping for this particular tutorial. But start by taking all five of your rings. You're going to have two compression rings and two oil rings. First, you're going to want to take your expander ring and put it in its gap. Next, you're going to take your wiper rings. Now the wiper rings being thinner are pretty malleable, but because they're thinner, they're not as strong either. So be careful when you're stretching them around the piston. Be sure not to accidentally damage them or bend them in any way. If you accidentally bend one, get a new ring. The oil rings go one on top of the expander ring and one on bottom of the expander ring. Make sure you split the gaps in the rings by roughly 120 degrees from each other. This will ensure that you don't have a blow-by passage in the rings that could cause a loss of compression in a cylinder. Once you have your oil rings in place, it's time to move on to the compression rings. Get them roughly in place around the piston then use a set of ring spreaders to get them over around the piston. You're going to want to use ring spreaders because these are thicker, tougher rings than the oil rings, making them hard to manipulate. Again, just like the oil rings, adjust the gap in the rings by a roughly 120 degrees. 
This is again to ensure that you don't have a blow by path that causes a loss of compression in the cylinder. Repeat this for all of the pistons. Now it's time to install the pistons. The first thing you're going to want to do is take some engine oil, put it on your hand, and wipe the cylinders down with a layer of engine oil. This will ensure that they have a nice, smooth, lubricated surface when you're installing the pistons so they don't gall or mar the cylinder surface. Next, you're going to want to do exactly the same thing for the piston itself. Using some engine oil, generously lubricate all of the rings in the piston rod assembly. Then do exactly the same thing for the outer surface of the piston. Now these are Silverlite flat top cast pistons made out of aluminum. These pistons are designed for a 20 thousandths overbore as well as the rings, but we've had them coated by line to line to add an additional 5 thousandths to the diameter since we had to overbore the block to 25 thou. Next, load the piston into a piston ring compressor. This will compress the rings enough so that the piston can actually slide into the cylinder inside the block. Be very careful when loading the piston into the block, taking care not to accidentally mar the surfaces on the rod bolts. Before you install the piston into the block, ensure that you've installed one half of the rod bearing and generously lubricated the journal surface on the main crank. Use a rubber mallet to lightly tap the piston down into place until the rod makes contact with the journal. Repeat this process for all the other pistons. You may have to rotate the crank to make it a little easier to install all of the pistons. Once you have all six pistons put in place, install the rod caps with the other half of the rod bearings. Now unfortunately we lost the footage of installing the timing chain, but ideally this would be the time that you would install the timing chain. We installed our double roller timing chain with zero degrees advance. Now it's in time to install the oil pump. Now something you'll want to take note of is that if you're using an aftermarket oil pump and you're using studs for the main bearing caps, you may have to make some slight modifications to the hardware and to the oil pump itself in order to clear the cap. Once you've addressed any clearance issues and you've final torqued it in place, now you can finally install the pickup tube. After you've installed the pickup tube and the oil pump, you'll want to measure the amount of play in the crank. To do this, set up a dial gauge at the end of the crank and then use a screwdriver to create a prying motion on the crank. The crank should have between four and five thousandths of play. Next, use feeler gauges to check the clearances between the rods, the crank, and the caps. Next, we install the timing chain cover seal. Now it's time to install the timing chain cover. Now we've already applied the gasket to the timing chain cover using that same aerospace grade sealant that you saw earlier. And we've applied a little bit to the block as well. Now for this particular build, all exterior hardware is actually using ARP grade 8 stainless steel bolts. Not only does it look good, but they're just as strong as regular bolts, but they won't corrode. Considering that we have a combination of aluminum and steel on this build, these were absolutely perfect. Just what we were looking for. Now that we have the timing chain cover installed, it's time to install the oil pan. We start by putting that aircraft sealant on all the sealing surfaces on the bottom of the block. Next we applied the oil pan gaskets on the sides.
then applying more sealant on top of the gasket itself. This will ensure that you have an absolutely leak-proof oil pan. The last thing you want is oil leaking out of your engine and getting onto your driveway, your sweet ride, and just generally draining your engine of oil. Next, it's time to install the front and rear seals for the oil pan. You're going to want to pay particularly close attention to when you install these to ensure that you get a nice even seal and you don't have any bulges when you go to put on the oil pan. Take your time when you do this. Once you've installed the front and rear seals, again we're putting more of the aircraft sealant on the seals themselves. Now finally it's time to put the oil pan on. When you're finally installing the hardware for the oil pan, remember not to over torque the oil pan by accident. If you do this you can over compress the seals and actually cause a leak from over torquing. Now it's time to install our lifters that we got from Claysmith Camps. Start by generously lubricating the bottom of each lifter and the bottom sides of each lifter. It helps to use a grease that has a high amount of ZDDP in it. Once lubricated, simply put them in the holes in the block and press them down into place. So with the bottom end or the block totally built up, that's actually where we're going to pause today's episode. So this will be part one of how to build the Ultimate Forge Freight 6. Uh, we're going to be coming back next week with part two where we build up the top end and show you the final completed product. Uh, thank you again, as always, for watching and a huge thank you again to our sponsors. Be sure to like and subscribe and I will see you guys next week for part two of how to build the Ultimate Forge Straight 6.